What's going on guys? In this video we're going to learn our first unsupervised learning algorithm of k-means cluster. So we're going to learn how it works, how to solve for it by hand, and finally what is within cluster variation. So what is unsupervised learning? So most of this exam is focused on supervised learning, but this chapter will be solely focused on unsupervised learning. So to define indifference is that supervised learning, we have a dependent variable. Where with unsupervised, we have no dependent variable. So a consequence of this is that when we use supervised learning, we're going to have clear cut measures on accuracy. Where we can just use either cross validation or some statistics to validate our mo model. Now with unsupervised learning, our results can be somewhat arbitrary. There's no way to say if we successfully created a good model or not. And with supervised learning, generally our main goal is to make some sort of predictions. Well, with unsupervised learning, we're looking to locate similarities and group our data. k-means cluster and how it works. So the main goal of k-means clustering is to ultimately group our observations into k different groups based off similarity, where similarity in this case just means Euclidean distance. So in order to run our algorithm, we first have to initialize a value of k. So choose k, where k is just going to be the number of groups that our observations are grouped into. So here we're going to use k is equal to 3. Now step two, we're going to randomly assign our observations to one of the k groups. So let's say these three observations are randomly assigned to group one. These three are randomly assigned to group two. And these three are randomly assigned to group three. So now step three. We're going to find our centroids for each of the groups. So what a centroid is, is just going to be the middle value of our observations in that group. So for blue, it might be right about here. For red, it might be around here. And then for green, it might be right around here. And now step four, we're going to reassign our observations to nearest centroid. So over here, we can put where we found our centroids. So our red was right about here, blue over here, and green over here. So now if we reassign our observations to the nearest centroid, this one would be given blue, this one would be given blue, this one would be given blue, and then these three would be given red because they're nearest to the red centroid. And then finally, these three would be given green. So then step five, we would just keep repeating these two steps until ultimately there's no changes in grouping. So if we look at our first two plots, we can see that this one went from the red grouping to the blue grouping. So ultimately we have to run another iteration. So we can do that now. So here's the centroid we found at the last step. Here's our red centroid, and here's our blue centroid. So now if we reassign our groups, or our observations to the nearest group, we will get the exact same thing we did in our last plot. So the observations all stayed in their respective same groups. So this is, this is when you know you're done with your algorithm or there's no more changes in your grouping. So the centroids would stay the same for now on and the observation groupings will stay the same for now on, no matter how many more iterations you run. Now the groupings we got from running this algorithm were ultimately we found, say, these three observations green, these three red, and these three blue. So this might not be the same if we were to rerun the algorithm. 
And this is because we have a random component to our algorithm, which is essentially we randomly assigned our observations at the beginning. So if instead at the beginning, if we were to say randomly assign these observations to a group and these observations to a group, we might ultimately end up with a different final conclusion to where our groupings of our observations are. So in order to counter this, you can rerun your algorithm multiple times and choose with whichever one creates the lowest total within cluster variation. Where total within cluster variation, we're gonna learn how to solve for later, but it's essentially gonna be the distances from your observations to your centroids. So whichever one creates the smallest value for that measurement, we're gonna choose as our final groupings for our k-means cluster and algorithm. So now we're gonna do everything we just learned above, except for we're gonna solve for it by hand. So here we have two groups, so we can say that k is equal to 2. And we have five observations that were randomly assigned to these two groups, and each of the observations have two variables, x1 and x2. So after we chose our k, we randomly assigned our observations. Now the next step is to find the centroids of each group. So the centroids are just going to be equal to our middle value, or the points x1 bar, x2 bar. So for x1 bar, it's just going to be the mean of our group 1 x1 observations. So 2 plus 6 plus 4 over 3, which gives a value of 4. And then our x2 bar is just going to be 5 plus 8 plus 2 over 3, which is 5. So our centroid for group 1 is just at point 4, 5. Now we can find our centroid for group 2 in the same way. So our x1 bar for group 2 is going to be 4 plus 10 over 2, which is equal to 7. And then our x bar 2 is just going to be equal to 3 plus 1 over 2, which is 2. So our centroid for group 2 is at 0.72. So now that we found our centroids, the next step is to reassign our observations to the nearest centroid. So we can start with observation 1, which is at 2, 5. So using Euclidean distance, we're going to check the distance between centroid 1, and we're going to check the distance between centroid 2, and whichever one's the smaller distance, we're going to reassign our observation to that centroid. So we'll start off checking how close it is to centroid 1. So the formula is just going to be the square root and then the sum of squares between the different observations. So it's going to be 2 minus 4 squared plus 5 minus 5 squared. And this will just give a value of 2. And now we can check how far it is from our centroid 2. So it's just going to be 2 minus 7 squared plus 5 minus 2 squared. We take the square root of it and we'll get a value of 5.83. So we can say observation 1 is going to get assigned to group 1. So it'll stay in the same group. So now we can do the same thing for observation 2, which is at point 0.68. So we're going to find the distance, Euclidean distance, from that to our first centroid. So 6 minus 4 squared plus 8 minus 5 squared. We take the square root and we're gonna get a value of 3.6. And then we can check how close it is to centroid two. So six minus seven squared plus eight minus two squared. We take the square root and we'll get a value of 6.1. So this observation will stay in group one. And then we'll skip ahead to observation 5, because ultimately it's just going to be the same thing over and over again. So to observation 5, which is at 10, 1. So the distance from 1 would just be 10 minus 4 squared plus 1 minus 5 squared. Take the square root and we'll get 7.2. And... Distance from centroid 2, we'll do 10 minus 7 squared plus 1 minus 2 squared. Take the square root and we'll get 3.2. So 
So for observation five, notice that the smaller value is now in group one. So observation five is going to get reassigned to group one. And just from doing this in the past, observation three is going to end up with equal distance. So we're just going to keep in observation in group one, and then observation four is going to stay in group two. So notice that there's still changes. So in order to get to our final conclusion, we would have to run this algorithm again, where now we recalculate our centroid values and we would reassign our observations again. And we we'll keep doing this until ultimately these groupings stay the exact same for our observations. But let's say that our groupings did stay the same. So now we can calculate our within cluster variation. So the formula we're going to use for within cluster variation is going to be equal to two times the summation of our squared Euclidean distance from each of our observations to the centroid. So again, we're going to start off by locating our centroid for each of our groups. So for group one, she's going to be the mean of our x1 for that group. So 2 plus 6 plus 4 plus 4 over 4, which gives a value of 4. And then for x2 bar, it's just going to be 5 plus 8 plus 2 plus 3 over 4, which gives a value of 4.5. So our centroid for group one is at points four, 4.5. And then for group two, since it's only one observation, the centroid is going to be at that observation. So it's going to be at 10 comma one. So now that we found our centroid, we have to find the squared Euclidean distance from each of our observations to that centroid. So for observation one, it's going to be at a value of two, five. So the squared Euclidean distance where the Euclidean distance was equal to the square root, and then we summed up the square values of our distances. So since now it's the squared Euclidean distance, if we're squaring a square root, we're just going to be left with the square values of our distances. So for observation one, the distance is going to be 2 minus 4 squared, and then plus 5 minus 4.5 squared. And this will give a value of 4.25. For observation two, it's at point six eight, so it would just be six minus four squared plus eight minus four point five squared, and we get sixteen point two five. For observation three, it's at point four two, so four minus four squared plus two minus four point five squared we get 6.25 and then finally for observation 4 we will get it's at points 4 3 so 4 minus 4 squared plus 3 minus 4.5 squared to get 2.25 so now that we found our squared euclidean distances from each of our observations to the centroids we want to sum up this number so this will give a value of 29 and then we want to multiply it by 2. So if we do 2 times 29, we get 58. So the total intercluster variance for group 1 is 58. Now in order to find the total intercluster variance of our total model, we'd have to sum it up over all our groups. So for group 2, since the observation is at the centroid, the distance is just going to be 0. So we can just do 58 for group one plus, and then for group two, it's just zero. So the total intercluster variance for a model is just going to be 58. Now, since this is only a local minimum, and if we reassign our observations, we might get a different value. If we were to reassign our values and we get a value below 58, so say we got 55 next time we reassigned our observations at the beginning, then we would take that model or that groupings instead of this one. So ultimately, you want to run the model multiple times, and whichever one gives the smallest total intercluster variance, you want to choose as your final model and final groupings. Closing thoughts and summary. 
with k means clustering, we have to choose a value of k before we even start running our algorithm. So this means we have to choose the number of groups before we even see how our algorithm is going to interact with the data. Now, as we increase this value of k, our within cluster variance is going to decrease. This is because as we increase the value of k, we're going to have more centroids. So on average, our observations are going to be closer to the centroids. Now, picking the value of k can be arbitrary, as we described earlier, which is one of the problems of unsupervised learning. But one method you can use to pick your value of k would be to run your algorithm with different values of k and then form a plot of the within cluster variance for each of your k values. So on the y-axis, we can have our within cluster variance. And then on our x-axis, we have different values of k. So as we increase our value of k, our within cluster variance should decrease. And if you notice at the plot, there's big de decreases between k is equal to 1 and k is equal to 2, and k is equal to 2 and k is equal to 3. But after k is equal to 3, there's only small decreases with our within cluster variance. So from using this plot, we can say a likely good candidate for our k value, or the number of groups from our k means clustering, would be k is equal to 3. And then finally, just to reiterate, you should run your algorithm more than once for each value of k because it's going to arrive at a local optimum because there's a randomization factor when you first initialize your observation. So that's going to wrap up this section. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time for hierarchical clustering. Thanks.